Okay, guys. So we are we are on the call right now for the Activision Blizzard fourth quarter calendar 2018 results conference call. That's the uh, that's the official name of it. <clears throat> um, basically, what they're doing right here is uh, they're going to be talking about. They're going to be talking about basically the results of, I mean, the fourth quarter, I guess, is, is what it is because they do these quarterly, but it, it kind of caps off 2018, and um, it'll be really interesting to see, right, because there's, I think that WoW and really classic WoW hype was, was really high around BlizzCon time going up after blizzcon it was really awesome with the demo and stuff going on and then after the demo ended i think a lot of people felt like wow was just like what do i do like i, I don't feel like playing wow you know I, I know for me i felt the same way and that's why i've been doing variety and stuff lately and uh you know whether whether you like retail or, or you don't like retail or whatever i think uh i think that that you know that's that's a uh, oh, let me turn on the music just a tad um I think that's like a different discussion, right? But I, I think that a lot of people who maybe have been longtime retail players felt like they hit a wall and it's like, you know, I don't have anything to do. And uh, I think even with the demo, right? The demo was totally scuffed. It had all kinds of problems. Uh, I still think even that demo brought about such a strong sense of community and it was such a fun thing that uh, a lot of people were like, wow, like what the crap, man? Like. Just comparing that to like the the regular gameplay of retail WoW, of just kind of like oh I'm logging in, I'm doing like my daily stuff and world quests and this and that. It's just like, and I think it gave people a real uh, a real taste of what they could see in classic. And I don't think that it necessarily. I I don't know. I, I'm not gonna say that it directly like having the demo hurt WoW, but uh, I think for some people it it, it might have actually done that. You know what I mean? I think for some people it might have actually done that, which is uh, kind of interesting. Kind of interesting to think about. <clears throat> Here to see how bad our favorite company is doing. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, pretty much. Um, will Method make a new guild up for World First Class? I, I, I don't know. Uh, the plans for Classic and Method are very, very... Uh, it, it's not like fully thought out yet. Like there's there's basically some plans like or some thoughts right going around here and there uh, I'm still planning on making my own guild because you know, I, I'm us. I want to play on a PvP server um, Method does it doesn't necessarily you know just because method doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to be EU But uh, and it doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to be PvE. I just think that it probably makes more sense for uh, if it's like a serious like world first method guild then it, it probably makes the most sense for them to go for a, go on a uh, PVE server. So, method raid three, yeah, yeah, I don't know about that one. So, that's what happened to me. Classic made me decide I was done with retail. Yeah, it's kind of funny how that works for some people. I, I don't know if that was a if that was a universal thing or what, but uh, I think it's certainly uh, I think it certainly was the case for a lot of people. Do you know that method went 100,000? Uh, yeah, I mean, they, they used a bunch of gold luck because they were like... I think, like, you gotta do what you gotta do. Like, in terms of, like, getting all the gold that you can and whatever to, uh... Using, using pretty much all your resources to, uh, get whatever edge you can, right? I think that's fine. I know, like, all, all those guilds do the same thing. I'm out of loot, but is Classic gonna have a subscription fee? So, Bird Up, what's gonna happen is... Uh, there's not going to be an initial payment fee for Classic. It's just that if you have a WoW sub, you have access to Classic as well as, um, Classic as well as Retail WoW. So, Frunkles, thank you for the Twitch Prime, man. Appreciate that, dude. How do you get this background? This is from Wallpaper Engine on Steam. Yeah. Get a snack on Flaming Hot Cheetos and pray they mention Classic. I, I, I don't particularly expect them to mention Classic outside of, uh, maybe just, like, bait. You know, like, oh, Investors, Classic is coming out next year. It's going to be, you know, ho hopefully it's going to be really exciting or whatever. But I don't think we're going to get any, like, real news about Classic in terms of... I mean, I don't know. At this point, dude, I'll take anything, right? But I, I wouldn't get my hopes up too much about, like, real news. <clears throat> you can only sell a Classic. It's going to be at the price. No, no, that's not the case. That's not how it's going to be. What name is my guild going to have? I'm not sure yet. I haven't decided. Yeah, I, I haven't decided. Yeah, Apperty, it, it's rough, dude, because, like, 
I mean, like, whenever it gets to the point, like, the, the big thing that's going to be interesting is the the layoffs, right? Like, if they lay off a bunch of people, and because that's what people are expecting, and it may have already happened. I'm sure they're not going to wait till the end of the day. Uh, I'm sure it probably happened. Like, we probably just haven't heard yet, you know? Um, but it'll, it'll, I think it'll come out slowly, like, hey, you know, I got laid off, this or that. Uh, cause there's, there's good people that work at Blizzard, and then there's people that, like, are... I, I think, I think just because people are frustrated at the company doesn't necessarily mean that you should be frustrated at the people, right? Like... I know from like going to BlizzCon and talking to like specific people, like there are specific people that are good people and they want what's best for WoW and they like they're on board with a lot of the stuff that we as a community are on board with. The problem is, is that there's also and this is like this in any company, there's inhibitors. Any any work situ like work uh, environment that. Oh, okay, I thought it was starting. Any work environment that I've, I've been in, there was always, like, there's always that one guy. There's always people out there that are essentially inhibitors. And I'm sure you guys feel the same way. Where you've been... You've been working somewhere and you want to do something, you want to accomplish something, and there's people who are above you that inhibit that. That they, they basically put down... Um, the potential for growth, whether it's like for something for the company or whether it's something for uh, you personally, right? Did Twitch crash? I don't know. I don't think so. Hey, that's fan. I'd like to start watching more of your streams. You seem to be very down to earth. Thank you, man. Appreciate that, dude. <clears throat> Will I play Rhett and Classic? Yeah, I will. I will, Super John. What percentage do you think that private server community will play with Small Classic? I think it's going to be very small, actually. Uh, relatively small, right? Because you think about anything with like a full release versus like the private server players. I think. Can you guys read the chat on the screen, by the way? Is the call here yet? No, it's not. It's not here yet. How about I do this? Duplicate. Investor. Call. Dude, I actually feel like I'm on hold. Like, I actually feel like I'm on hold right now. It's kind of hilarious. Are we starting? Please stand by. Good day and welcome to the Activision Blizzard Q4 2018 earnings conference call. Today's conference is being recorded. At this time, I would like to turn the conference over to Chris Hickey. Please go ahead, sir. Please go ahead, Good sir. Afternoon. Good afternoon and thank you for joining us today for Activision Blizzard's fourth quarter 2018 conference call. With us are Bobby Kotick, CEO, Cody Johnson, COO, and Dennis Durkin, company CFO and president of Emerging Businesses. And for Q&A, Rob Kostich, president of Activision, Jay Allen Brack, president of Blizzard, Ricardo Sacconi, CEO of King, and Humam Sakini, president of King, will also join us. I would like to remind everyone that during this call, we will be making statements that are not historical facts. The forward-looking statements in this presentation are based on information available to the company as of the date of this presentation. And while we believe them to be true, they ultimately may prove to be incorrect. What? The of factors <laughs> what? Actual <laughs> what is that supposed to mean? Circumstances to differ materially <laughs> from those expressed in any forward-looking statements. These include the risk factors discussed in our SEC filings, including our 2017 annual report on Form 10K, and those. A little bit louder. Showing. The company undertakes no obligation to release publicly any revisions to any forward-looking statements to reflect events or circumstances after today, February 12th, 2019. I know, I know, I know, I know it's a normal statement. I just think it's funny. 
We provide non-GAAP financial measures which exclude the impact of expenses related to stock-based compensation, the amortization of intangible assets and expenses related to acquisitions, including legal fees, costs, expenses and accruals, expenses related to debt financings and refinancings, restructuring charges, the associated tax benefit of these excluded items, and the impact of certain significant discrete tax-related items. These non-GAAP measures are not intended to be considered in isolation from, as a substitute for, or superior to our GAAP results. We encourage investors to consider all measures before making... This is as loud as I can make it. Please refer to our earnings release, which is posted on www.activisionblizzard.com for a full GAAP to non-GAAP reconciliation and further explanation with respect to our non-GAAP measures. There's also an earnings presentation, which you can access with the webcast and which will be posted to the website following the call. In addition, we will also be posting a financial overview highlighting both GAAP and non-GAAP results. And now, I'd like to introduce our CEO, Bobby Kotick. Thank you, Chris, and thank you all for joining us today. We once again achieved record results in 2018. We delivered record GAAP revenue and GAAP and non-GAAP EPS for both the fourth quarter and the year. For 2018, we generated record GAAP revenues across all three platforms, and both Activision and King achieved record segment financial results. While we had record performance in 2018, it didn't quite live up to our expectations. We didn't execute as well as we hoped to in 2018, and our current outlook for 2019 falls below what is possible in an industry filled with growth opportunities. We measure our success by growth in reach, engagement, and player investment, and while we had record financial results in 2018, we didn't achieve the reach, engagement, and player investment goals we set for ourselves. 2019 will require significant change to enable us to achieve our long-term goals and objectives. We're making changes to enable our development teams to create better content for our biggest franchises more quickly. Across our key franchises, we're adding development talent to ensure our teams can deliver exactly what our fans have come to expect from our games. Yeah, that'd a be consistent nice. flow of compelling content. We'll also increase our focus on adjacent opportunities with demonstrated potential like eSports for Overwatch League and Call of Duty. We're staffing up production on our incubation efforts faster and increasing our investment in live services, in our tools, in our Battle.net platform, and in new areas like our fast-growing esports and advertising efforts, but all with an intense focus on excellence so we never disappoint our players. Our pipeline is excellent and our development talent the very best in the world, but we need to refocus our efforts so that our development and production resources are better aligned with our priorities. We're reducing or eliminating investment in games and initiatives that weren't living up to player expectations or our leadership teams have determined may not live up to player expectations in the future. To drive improved execution and to fund development investment, we will in certain parts of the business reduce complexity and duplication in our back office functions, consolidate certain commercial operations, and revamp our consumer marketing capabilities to reflect our continued migration to a largely digital network. While this isn't the shift in our strategy, achieving better execution requires change. Change that requires new leadership and organizational commitment to change. Hmm. We operate in an industry with proven growth and changes, <laughs> and we haven't grown at the rate what? that reflects the opportunities our industry affords. Maybe these are good changes. We have new business unit leadership committed to serving our players, our employees, and our shareholders. And I'm also very pleased to have Dennis Durkin back as CFO and overseeing our emerging businesses. His steady, responsible stewardship of our capital and his strong relationships with his colleagues served us well during his five-year prior tenure as CFO. As always, I want to thank our customers, our players, and our partners, but especially today, our employees and our shareholders for their commitment and their support. And now, yeah, before you fire Bobby, a bunch of them. <laughs> thanks, Bobby. Before we discuss, lay them off. Steps it's two different things. We are taking lay to reinforce off. the foundation for future growth. Let's first review our quarterly results. In Q4. We generated record GAAP revenues of $2.38 billion, including the net deferral of $454 million. Net bookings were also a record at $2.84 billion. 
We generated Q4 GAAP EPS of $0.84 cents and Q4 non-GAAP EPS of $0.90, cents, also both Q4 company records, including the net deferral of $0.39. Cents. While GAAP revenue, net bookings, and both GAAP and non-GAAP EPS were company records, our net bookings fell short of our outlook due to factors I will explain in our segment results. Activision Q4 segment revenues grew 6% year-over-year to $1.41 billion, and operating income increased 14% year-over-year to $723 million, with monthly active users increasing double digits quarter-over-quarter to $53 million. The primary driver for the Activision segment was Call of Duty, which generated more upfront sales than any Mm. other console franchise worldwide in 2018, a feat the franchise has accomplished for nine of the last ten years. Black Ops 4 sold through more units than Black Ops 3 in its launch quarter, with PC units more than tripling. And engagement was strong, with average hours per player increasing versus Black Ops 3 as players enjoyed Blackout, multiplayer, and zombies. We also saw a significant shift to digital this year, with full game downloads, representing over 40% of console sell-through not surprising. versus approximately 30% for World War II. However, sales of Black Ops 4 in the second half of the quarter were below our outlook due to weaker-than-expected retail demand, lower-than-anticipated pricing, and other promotional what? activities that didn't meet expectations. Right. Although Black yeah. Ops 4 in-game net bookings started off slower than expected following the introduction of the new in-game system, We were encouraged by the response we saw when we introduced more compelling content with the second season of events in late Q4. Turning to Destiny, the mutual agreement with Bungie to sell back the commercial rights to Destiny and eliminate our ongoing investment in the game did not have a material impact on Activision segment operating income in the quarter, but will free up capital and development resources for the future. We also continue to drive strong performance for the beloved intellectual property from our library, following the successful launch of Spyro in Q4, and the ongoing contribution of Crash Bandicoot, which has sold in over 10 million units since its 2017 release, again highlights the enduring nature of our classic franchises. Overall, Activision delivered meaningful year-over-year growth for segment revenue and for operating income, and with the changes we are implementing in 2019, we expect to drive even stronger performance in the years to come. Blizzard was a more nuanced story in Q4. Okay, here we go. On the one hand, we grew Q4 segment revenues to $686 million in operating income to $241 million. And Blizzard had 35 million monthly active users in the quarter as Overwatch and Hearthstone saw sequential stability and World of Warcraft saw expected declines post the expansion release this summer. On the other hand, the relatively consistent monthly active user trends for Blizzard's communities were not matched by in-game net bookings, which continued to soften. In particular, Overwatch and Hearthstone both experienced sequential declines in net bookings from players making in-game purchases. Hmm. Lastly, Blizzard results benefited from the continued success of our business in China and the extension of our partnership with NetEase. China. Building on our 11-year joint venture, the expanded agreement runs until January 2023 and reflects the substantial value and opportunity for Blizzard's content in China. Hmm. While the majority of the economics from our renewed arrangement will be recognized over the next four years, Q4 did benefit from the agreement, which was contemplated in our outlook. So now, I don't I'll understand. go into more detail in a minute. But increasing World of saw expected and declines. of compelling in-game content and upfront releases to serve the needs of our players is the number one goal set by the new Blizzard leadership team going forward. Finally, King grew segment revenue and operating income year over year as it continued to recover from the network incident experienced in the second quarter. Q4 segment revenues grew 5% year over year to $543 million, and operating income increased 28% year over year to $207 million. King monthly active users of $268 million grew sequentially for the first time since we acquired the business in Q1 2016, driven by the Mm. successful launch of Candy Crush Friends in October. Candy Crush Friends is seeing strong monetization and retention trends, contributing incremental growth for the Candy Crush franchise, which overall grew net bookings 
and monthly active users, both quarter over quarter and year over year. This encouraging um, thing performance is, like, sets the foundation for King to ramp its marketing support and drive further growth for friends in 2019. We're, we're PC gamers. Now, importantly, right? our advertising initiative continued to gain momentum, growing net bookings over 50% sequentially and again profitably as the team continues to I wish to I could pause this. I don't want to. Opportunities. Now, taking a step back and looking at our full year results for 2018, we delivered record gap revenue, gap and non-gap EPS and net bookings. We continue hey, to make chill encouraging out, dude. progress in to talk mobile, to chat, dude. advertising, and esports. However, in-game execution was inadequate for some of our franchises, and we saw weaker than anticipated retail demand. As you will hear from Dennis, hmm. our 2019 outlook assumes that we will not improve in-game monetization as quickly as we would like, and that it is a transition year where we have less new major content to release than we should. So, we have worked with our new business unit leaders to undertake a comprehensive examination of our business to determine the changes we need to make to improve execution and capitalize on the substantial long-term growth opportunities for our company. We've determined that we need to refocus our best resources on our biggest opportunities and to remove an unnecessary level of complexity and duplication that is built up in certain parts of the business. Hmm. We have therefore developed a clear plan for this year to refocus and reinforce the foundation for growth. This refocus includes initiatives developed by our new business unit leaders, each of whom has demonstrated the ability to combine creative excellence with a commercial focus on profitable growth. First, we are investing more in development for our biggest internally owned franchises across upfront releases, in-game content, mobile, okay. and geographic expansion. That's good. Second, we are deprioritizing initiatives that are not meeting our expectations and reducing certain non-development and administrative related costs across our business. Third, we are integrating our global and regional sales and go-to-market partnerships and sponsorships capabilities across the business enabling us to better leverage talent, expertise, and scale on behalf of our business units. Okay. Our restructuring plan sheds investment in less productive, non-strategic areas of our business and will result in a net headcount reduction so, of approximately 8%, right here. while also driving a significant increase in investment, focus, and capabilities around our biggest franchises. We are confident that over time this plan will enable our teams to accelerate the delivery of high quality content to our communities. We've already kind of started doing this with, with Heroes of the Storm. And hire new talent. We are planning for the number of developers working on Call of Duty, Candy, Overwatch, Warcraft, Hearthstone, and Diablo to increase in aggregate by approximately 20% over the course of the coming year. Oh, they want to ha hire more for devs? Call of Duty, Activision Management expects additional resources to deliver more frequent content updates and events for the franchise and accelerate its expansion across platforms and geographies. We also intend to build on our experience with the Overwatch League to launch a professional city-based Call of Duty League that drives franchise engagement and represents a sizable incremental economic opportunity. Okay. We are also increasing coordination across our Call of Duty studios with unified development. I think I think Apex I think Apex Legends basically just dumped on Call of Duty. user experience and leverage our development. Yeah, I, I think I think Apex expertise. Legends basically just dumped on Call of Duty. For Candy, Call of Duty King League management will increase its focus be a bad on idea? reach I don't know. and monetization with in game. But I think Apex Legends is, is at least off to a really, really strong start. In Candy development resources. The advertising business will continue to add engineering and direct sales resources to support our plans for strong revenue and operating income growth in twenty nineteen and beyond. The Overwatch team is also growing as it focuses on delivering a significant content pipeline in the coming years. And the Overwatch League remains a key strategic focus where we will grow the number of resources involved to drive an expanded product and year-on-year -year revenue growth. World of Warcraft is an example of a franchise where Blizzard has already established a regular cadence of major content and in-game operations. Additionally, Blizzard is investing in other Warcraft games, working on more ways for the community to engage with its enduring and beloved right. franchise. Reforged, for Hearthstone, classic. Additional development resources will help to release content that is both broader and deeper, and to optimize the game to deliver an even better mobile experience for its global audience. And Diablo's development headcount will grow substantially, 
as the teams work on several projects underway for the franchise, as well as the global launch of Diablo Immortal. Overall, Blizzard's management is reinforcing its pipeline with more resources than ever before to support planned mobile titles, several PC and console releases, and WoW's continued cadence of content. Finally, as a company, we will continue to invest in breakthrough new ideas and incubation with focused resources and some of our best creative talent. With 2019 set to be a quieter year for upfront launches, now is the right time to implement this plan. Work is already underway across the company as we speak. We expect to have completed the North American components of our plan by the end of Q1, with implementation of the international components by end of year. And we have already started to increase developer resources on our biggest franchises and will be aggressively hiring talent in the coming quarters. As we look forward to the coming years, we plan for all of our major franchises to be operating at scale and capitalizing on opportunities that include robust ongoing live operations and regular content launches, both large and small, strong mobile experiences available for all of their communities to enjoy, new engagement and monetization models, including where appropriate esports and advertising. And underpinning all our franchises will be our deep relationships with growing and vibrant communities which are increasingly direct and digital. In short, we are refocusing the entire company to return to the franchise focus that has fueled our long-term success and to better leverage the scale of our business for future growth. I'll now turn the call over to Dennis to provide our outlook right. for 2019. Dennis? Thanks, Scotty. It's, it sounds nice. Before right. I discuss the 29 and deliver, 2019 you know? and Q1 outlook, Cap, yeah, I just exactly. wanted to take a moment to say how excited I am to be back. It's basically just they're speaking in buzzwords exactly a lot of times. And operational position as the CFO, as well as a leader of our emerging businesses. We have a tremendous team, and although we have a lot of work in front of us, I see a stronger pipeline and more opportunities for long-term growth than ever before. As Bobby and Cotty mentioned, 2019 will be a transition year for us as we implement change to enable our teams to create better content for our biggest franchises more quickly. Given limited frontline releases, the organizational work underway, and the current competitive environment, we are planning for this year to be down year over year. I'll first go through the segments, including Slate, to provide some context for the outlook, starting with Activision. The main driver for the segment will be the Call of Duty franchise. Heading into 2019, we have momentum to build on given the launch of Black Ops 4, with the franchise yet again number one globally in upfront sales in 2018. We will continue to optimize in-game content this year to drive ongoing engagement and player investment. And in Q4, we will have another major launch for the franchise that will appeal broadly to both existing and new fans with what I can only describe now as a great step forward in the franchise that is also rooted in some of the franchise's most important history. We have high expectations for the game. Q4? But for modeling purposes. So, hey, they're basically saying classic. Wait, was that? Was that? Planning on upfront Q4 were they alluding to classic? Black Ops 4. We will also in bring Call of Duty to mobile with our partner. Oh, that's for COD. Oh, my bad. I misunderstood. You expect, we take I misunderstood. I misunderstood. approach in assuming no material operating I, I was this like... initiative this year. Outside, outside of Call of Duty, we will release Sekiro in Q1, and our strategy of reimagining classic franchises will continue with Crash Team Racing on multiple platforms later this year. We will not generate material revenue from Destiny in 2019 following the sale of publishing rights to Bungie. Excluding Destiny in both years, our outlook is roughly flat for net bookings for the rest of the Activision segment in 2019. Turning to Blizzard, we expect materially lower financial performance this year. 2018 <laughs> benefited from the release of World of Sorry. Warcraft, Battle for Azeroth, whereas we are not planning a major frontline release for Blizzard in 2019. How is and Classic not a major for my release? For its in-game revenues that will take time to stabilize and return to growth. While these factors will weigh on Blizzard's financial financials this year, looking further ahead, Blizzard's pipeline oh, of PC, not console, and mobile content is richer than ever, and we expect the significant addition of development resources to accelerate the pace of delivery over time. Finally, King is entering 2019 with momentum as it continues to recover from the network incidents it experienced in Q2. The business will continue to face tougher comps in the first few months of the year until it crosses the anniversary of this disruption. Nonetheless, we yeah, expect it doesn't have a separate sub, but it's going to increase the current amount of subs for the candy franchise and the because people who are not sub business. Bringing all this together to the total company, people who level, are not sub are going to sub to WoW to play classic. Declining 13 percent year over year. The Blizzard segment. There, I think the they're. I think they're underestimating it too. Hefarsi. 2019 release slate and in-game performance. 
the lower net bookings from Destiny is also a factor. The lower net bookings performance translates into lower segment operating income, and our outlook assumes a high teens year-over-year -year decline. Again, the Blizzard segment... No, it's not RIP Classic. They didn't change. cancel Classic. It's a joke. Activision segment operating income is also expected to be lower due to the following factors. First, we are planning to invest more in Call of Duty this year, including to support platform and geographic expansion. And second, we will not generate meaningful operating inc income from Destiny this year. Although I would note that this is consistent with our planning assumptions were we to have continued publishing the game. King's segment operating income is planned to be roughly flat as we invest in candy marketing to build on the encouraging start for candy friends. Finally, I would note that we are planning for a higher tax rate this year. <laughs> While our 2018 GAAP tax rate included one-time benefits from U.S. tax reform and our IRS settlement, both our GAAP and non-GAAP 2019 rates incorporate the full impact of new inter international tax provisions. With that context, context I'll de detail the financial guidance for 2019 and Q1. On a GAAP basis for 2019, we expect Revenues of $6.03 billion, including gap deferrals of $275 million. We expect net bookings of $6.3 billion. Product costs, game operations, and distribution expenses of 24%. Operating expenses, including software amortization of 56%. And a gap only charge of approximately $150 million relating to the restructuring plan Cadi outlined. We expect gap and non-gap net interest expense of zero, a gap tax rate of 24%, GAAP and non-GAAP share count of $775 million and EPS of $1.18. For 2019, 2019 on a non-GAAP basis, we expect product costs, game operations, and distribution expenses of 24%, and operating expenses including software amortization of 46%. We expect a non-GAAP tax rate of 20% and non-GAAP EPS of $1.85, which includes GAAP deferrals of $0.25. Cents. For Q1, on a GAAP basis, we expect revenues of $1.72 billion, which includes the recognition of GAAP deferrals of $540 million. We expect net bookings of $1.18 billion. Product costs, game operations, and distribution expenses of 20%. Operating expenses, including software amortization, of 57%. And we expect approximately $100 million of the GAAP-only restructuring charge to be booked in Q1. We expect GAAP and non-GAAP net interest expense of zero, a GAAP tax rate of 24%, GAAP and non-GAAP share count of $772 million, and EPS of $0.39. Cents. And for Q1 on a non-GAAP basis, we expect product costs, game operations, and distribution expenses of 20%, and operating expenses including software amortization of 43%. We expect a non-GAAP tax rate of 22% and non-GAAP EPS of $0.63. Cents which includes the recognition of gap deferrals of $0.43. Cents. Turning to capital allocation, I wanted to spend a moment to quickly review our historical track record just as context. As most of you know, we have always taken a disciplined and balanced approach to capital allocation. We view a strong balance sheet as a strategic asset, and while our focus in recent years has been on paying down debt with over $4 billion repaid in the last five years, we've also returned almost $11 billion to our shareholders over the last decade with around $2 billion in dividends and $9 billion in share repurchases. With this balanced approach in mind, our board has authorized the following. A 9% increase in our dividend to $0.37 cents per share payable in May. And also a new two-year $1.5 billion share repurchase authorization. Before I conclude, I wanted to summarize the company's position heading into 2019. We continue to have a tremendous potential in front of us. Our combination of leading owned franchises, a direct digital connection to our consumers, best-in-class developer talent, and geographic, platform, and business model diversity creates a powerful foundation for longer-term growth. We must and will I wish relentlessly just talk focus like, on like normal sometimes, but uh, business excellence and quality content delivery that has been the backbone of our company. We have to throw these buzzwords in all the time years. and fluff it our up. Our plan to increase our focus on on our core franchises is consistent with that approach and I am confident that executing against our plan will position us to deliver strong results and shareholder value over the long term. Looking ahead, I look forward to updating you on our results as we make progress throughout this year. Now I welcome our business leaders, Ricardo, Humam, Rob, and Jay. So from what it sounds like, the call. from what it sounds like right now, it, it seems like they, they are going to lay Thank off you. a bunch of people. If you'd like to ask a question, please signal by but pressing star 1 on your telephone keypad. 
If you're using a speakerphone, please make sure so your mute function is turned bit. off to allow your signal so to be it, there, it seems like they're going to lay a bunch of people off, or they, they may, maybe probably already have. Uh, it's just you know not public who all that is. But I, I think that it seems like they're trying to increase the amount of developers they have on the teams. So it might be something good for the company. It just sucks for the people that work there, you know? Sure, thanks, Colin. Uh, this is Cody. I'll, I'll take that one. Um, you know, I guess stepping back, as we shared during the call, our plan is focused on delivering growth in reach. Uh, in oh, Wow had already said that the, the major layoffs have gone through. Is what I thought. One is refocusing on our own franchises, where we feel like we have the highest opportunity for growth. Uh, two is making sure we have the right amount of development resources to then go deliver great content within those franchises to our player communities. Oh, 30 minutes ago they posted And then we're appropriate benefiting from company scale and removing duplication and inefficiency. Uh, and so to do this with the new leadership teams, there's three specific and important changes, you know, uh, as we head into 2019 that we plan to deliver. The first is investing in development on our main franchises. You know, as I mentioned, a 20% increase to drive the content and cadence and pace. Second is is reducing and eliminating initiatives that are not meeting our expectations uh, and also areas where we can find uh, duplication and remove it. And then third, integrating our global and regional sales and go-to-market and partnerships and sponsorships so we can leverage scale. You know, we know we have a global and you know, fan player base that is looking for content on a regular cadence to come more quickly and to come across multiple platforms. And we think we have set up each of our operating divisions to be able to deliver on that. We also think we've better set up the company to be able to deliver on that as we leverage those areas where scale can really help to bring our content and our franchises out to the world. Uh, as for timing, uh, you know, and as you see those effects, we're only guiding to 2019 today. Uh, but what I can say is that we are confident in the growth opportunity ahead of us. Our increased focus, you know, our investment, uh, leaning into our big franchises, it's a sign that we are headed towards a place where growth given the right resources, given the right plan, can be realized. Thank you. Operator, can we have the next question, please? We'll now take a question from Evan Wingren with KeyBank Capital uh, Markets. Yeah. Um, just wondering if you could provide us a bit more commentary on the components of your guidance for fiscal 19, how you see uh, your franchises performing, and, and how you see the seasonality of the year unfolding. Yeah, thanks, Evan. Uh, it's Dennis here. Uh, happy to provide some color on that. Um, I guess first, just kind of helicoptering up a little bit, there are a few things to think about as it relates to our outlook. I think the first point is obviously the one uh, relative to our release, release slate which is diminishing uh, this year or down this year, um, and it does obviously imp impact our outlook. Um, in addition, the in-game softness that we saw uh, exiting 18 uh, caused us to enter the year at a slightly lower trajectory than last year, and although we have a plan to turn that around, it's going to take some time, and so we don't actually assume a full recovery of that in 2019. Mm. And then we also are pretty conservative in terms of how we plan for some of the newer things in our, in our pipeline, like our mobile games. Um, we do uh, obviously uh, shoot for breakout hits, but it's very hard to obviously um, uh, prudently plan for those in your, in your outlook. So we're obviously more conservative on that. And then the last piece I would just say is relative to our tax rate. You heard a few of the comments about it, it being up because of some of our international considerations this year. So those are the main considerations, I guess, just relative to the overall outlook. As it relates to seasonality, um, given the limited number of product launches this year, Q4 will again be uh, a very important quarter. Um, again, we've tried to take a prudent approach uh, relative to that, assuming that Call of Duty units are down year over year in our outlook. Um, I would say that the team that's building this uh, new game for us uh, in Activision is, uh, is building what they believe is the best Call of Duty we've ever built. And uh, so that team is certainly targeting growth, even though we haven't uh, put in our outlook uh, in that fashion. Wait, wait, so, did they say, did they say the game to back, come uh, or the current one? Approach relative to guidance and I do agree that the current Call of Duty is really good. This year is really I, I, I will agree with that. We've set guidance in the past and, you know, a careful approach to guidance. Uh, I think they it's think the game to come is, oh, okay. particularly good. this year, given the changes in the industry and the amount of work we need to accomplish this year. Yeah, I mean, they're going to obviously the they're going to say that, right? So we'll see it when we see it, you know. We'll now take a question. 
from Ray Stochel with Consumer Edge Research. Great. Thanks so much for taking my question. I this do think Apex is Rob. better. Can you quickly yeah, Apex tell Legends us is just about better than how the current you are Call thinking of Duty. about leading Activision? And then give us an update on the Call of Duty Black Ops 4 launch and how that game is trending so far. Thanks. Hey, thanks for the question. Have Ray. I mentioned Classic? No, so not directly. It's about 15 years now, and I've touched just up nearly every part of the business. And what I really look forward to is you know, taking all those experiences and applying it in this broader capacity. You know, at a high level, I'm really focused on two things right now. It's our players and our people. Uh, you know, very simply, I'm very committed to our players and over-delivering on their expectations. That is just something we must do. Now, behind it all is our people. They're world-class. They are our foundation. And we want to continue to invest in them and to create an environment for them to do their best work. Yeah, or now, not work at all. Fire about 8% of them. <laughs> We do have a lot of opportunities right now. No, front. no, it's, it's different. Mobile, I understand. I uh, and PC expansion, and geographic expansion, especially in Asia, in esports, as was mentioned on the call already, and of course in business models that uh, continue to arise in our industry and create opportunity for us. And as a division, we have specific initiatives against each of these in progress that uh, we're excited about. Now, in terms of Black Ops 4, um, as Cotty mentioned, it delivered better unit sell-through than Black Ops 3 in its launch quarter. So what we have is a really strong foundation of players right now, and our biggest objective is driving ongoing engagement with our community. Now, the good news is we have our best in-game content coming still. Our next event on February 19th will be what we believe is our biggest and best in-game event. And it's going to have significant updates across all modes. And we're looking forward to see how that lands and resonates with the community. And then if I look even further ahead to what Dennis mentioned, um, it's worth mentioning again, this fall's launch, I think, is going to resonate very powerfully with our community. It is an amazing game. It's going to feature an entirely new campaign, a huge and expansive multiplayer world, and, of course, some fun co-op gameplay. But from day one, what gets me really excited is every time we've shown this title internally, um, it's just created a ton of buzz. Now, I wish I could tell you a lot more right now, but unfortunately you're going to have to wait. But I think it's going to be really worth it. We can't wait to share it with the world. No, we can't wait either. Right. <laughs> you know, I would just add, right, Bobby, that... No, uh, they did not cancel Classic. You know, when you look <laughs> over the last decade of Call of Duty content, I think that Rob is... Um, underselling what the internal enthusiasm is. I haven't seen this much enthusiasm that I can remember almost. The la ever. Dude, the last so, 10 years of Call of uh, Duty has sucked. About as far as I'm concerned. Of Call of Duty content. Great. Thank but you the, the, the newest one is pretty good. Uh, I think Our Apex Legends is right. just better. Brian but I think the last 10 years has been Stanley. pretty bad. Thanks for taking my question. One for. Uh, Probably Jay. I guess the question, Jay, is what what is what is the new management team doing just to make sure that Blizzard is, is back on track to executing as one of the top studios as it, as it should be? Thanks. Yeah, thanks for the question. You know, I think um, one of the things that I feel like it's important for us to talk about is, you know, we're a bit of a, a new leadership team. And, you know, as we've come together, it's clear that, you know, we believe a lot in our future and that we have a lot to prove from both a game and kind of a content delivery standpoint. You know, I think we have a huge amount of opportunity. We have fantastic IPs. We have lots of games that we want to create. And we have a, a very passionate community that is hungry for all of the things that, that, that we can kind of produce. So we have two big goals going forward. You know, and the first one of is, of course, to you know, make excellent video games. The second is to you know, find ways to deliver more content to our player communities. Um, you know, to meet these goals, we need to work to increase the amount of content that we're delivering. Um, right now, we have the largest lineup of PC, console, and mobile games that we've ever had. And we're working to meaningfully increase it doesn't really mean anything. in the development headcount. That investment like, in development talent is... You don't need a lot of games, you just need good games, right? 
you know, we're going to quality over quantity mentioned, we're going to reduce our non-development positions and our offices around the world, uh, specifically looking at our SGNA and non-core business units. Um, this was a very, very difficult. Yeah, it's, it's incredibly it's vague. A top five career difficult kind of moment for me personally, you know, but we're committed to doing everything that we can uh, to help get us into a good position going forward. You know, we really want to serve our players and we want to serve our communities in the best possible way and, and, and be a great creative organization. You know, as, as difficult as, as kind of all this is, I think, you know, we're, we're happy about the things that we're working on. Um, we're looking, working very hard to kind of live up to our mission. And, you know, we really look forward to the community and you all seeing the, the results of, of this increased development uh, work over time. I'd love to say, uh, it's really terrific for the company to have Jay's leadership. He's humble about his experiences. When you think about World of Warcraft and Hearthstone and the Warcraft franchise, uh, it's been one of the most successfully led franchises in all of video games, and uh, we couldn't be happier to have Jay in the role that he's in. Great, thanks. <laughs> we'll now take a question from Alexia Quadrani with J.P. Morgan. Uh, thank Chase you very Bank. much. Um, I guess my question is, given one of your competitors' decision to launch a free-to-play Battle Royale game, are you th rethinking the monetization model for any of your own games, maybe including Overwatch? Uh, sure, this is Cody. Uh, thanks for the question. Um, I guess maybe a couple of key points. Uh, first, stepping back, one of the things that sometimes gets lost in the discussion around economic models is the player and See, game See, they need to do this. Our North Star is to deliver compelling and engaging gameplay. Full stop. Uh, without the, that, no, they, no they, they, they. I, I think it wouldn't um, be a bad idea to get into the free-to-play market. That, I don't know, you know if that means changing Overwatch to free-to-play necessarily. Has to work with the franchise and the community and the gameplay. They need to work to reinforce each other. And we feel like we're in a pretty unique position, uh, honestly, across the industry, in that we have multiple business models running at scale across our franchises today. We have. Uh, free-to-play games, microtransaction-based games, games with an upfront charge or with a subscription. Uh, and we also now have advertising, uh, which is growing as well. And we think that provides a range of options for our product and development teams to look across and pair the best economic model with the best gameplay experience. Uh, one thing we know, though, is that we need to be able to move more quickly, and we need to be able to rapidly evolve with the demands of our players and the market. And that's why, you know, as I mentioned, we are investing significant development resources in our core franchises to be able to move more quickly on behalf of our players and to be able to take advantage of new business models. Um, and on, you know, on the free-to-play part of your question in particular, uh, obviously the most proven platform is mobile. So as we increasingly uh, bring Activision mobile. and Blizzard IP to the mobile space, you will see us deploy more free-to-play models. Uh, in, you know, embedded in your question, though, was also the fact that we see competitors now uh, on PC and console going free-to-play. And I just emphasize again that we believe our investment in resources, coupled with our strong IP, leaves us in a really good position to take uh, advantage of evolving business models in our industry. The, the last thing I'd say, and it's just worth mentioning, is that the success we see with you know, titles like Call of Duty or even recent competitive launches shows that a really well-built, well-polished AAA experience for players can come still with an upfront charge and it can be a great player experience and a great business model. So looking ahead, you know, we'll continue to evaluate all our games across our franchises and use the models that we think best, both for the player experience and, and for our business. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh our next question Look, I don't will have come a problem from Mike with, with Benchmark Company. Frick. I feel like I can't talk. I'll, I'll talk. Hey I'll guys, talk a little bit after, at the end. Questions. Uh, just focusing on your King segment. I was hopeful you could provide some more color on your Candy Friends launch. I guess how it went from your perspective and how it's performing now would be very helpful. Thank you. Hey, Mike. It's Umam here. Thanks for the question. Um, so Candy Crush Friends launched in October. It's been a great addition to the franchise. 
the game uh, has really got a lot of great new game modes and mechanics, and uh, we really think it's our most polished title ever. And it's uh, brought you know a lot of the franchise characters to life like never before. Dude. So what I would say is that after many years of uh, the teams operating the Candy franchise at scale, they've really poured all their learnings into the Candy franchise experience. And uh, <clears throat> what we're seeing is that that's, uh, that's paid off. Uh, it's really showing some strong retention. And uh, the game's uh, per player monetization metrics are well ahead of where the franchise's other uh, titles were at a similar point post-launch. Uh, and again, it really reiterates and demonstrates how kind of the years of experience uh, operating Candy uh, were funneled into uh, into the Candy Friends title. Uh, so we're off to a great start, uh, and we have more plans in 2019. Uh, the way I think about it is we're still in launch mode with Candy Friends, and uh, this is the year where we make uh, marketing and Candy Friends to support the title. And while we're doing that, uh, you know, the teams have uh, some really strong plans to drive engagement and monetization trends with some proven features uh, in the pipeline uh, to continue to delight the players. Um, so overall, very pleased with the momentum. And I expect uh, that the game will uh, really uh, help drive the Candy Crush fran franchise growth in 2019. Thank you. We'll take our next question from Tim O'Shea with Jeffries. Yes, thank you for taking my question. So with Overwatch C uh, League Season 2 launching soon, I just thought it made sense for an update on that franchise. It's been over two years since the game launched, and we've talked on prior calls and again on this call about the lower revenue levels. So I'm wondering what's the strategy to address this issue, and does, and does Blizzard have the development capacity to deliver sufficient levels of new content into this franchise? Thank you. Thanks for the question. This is Jay. Um, you know, I think it's important to mention the job the team has done with Overwatch. You know, we feel really strong about the overall IP, the universe, the characters, and the story potential, along with the global appeal for uh, for the game. And we've really built Overwatch League around that with uh, with early good results. You know, delivery of, of more content in Overwatch is something that's really important and something that we're focused on. You know, the team is delivering new heroes and new maps and new experiences. Um, and, you know, as you mentioned, the, you know, the game revenue has declined recently. I think the community engagement with the game remains, remains strong. Um, there are a lot of new ideas for the Overwatch franchise. You know, we feel like the Overwatch that you know it's just a small part of what we can imagine for the overall franchise. And the team has you know, a very clear plan. In order to deliver on that, we're going to increase, increase the size of the Overwatch team meaningfully. Uh, I, but keep in mind that that's gonna, we're going to need to balance they, the existing I, I was live this content the with uh, new products and different kind of support for Overwatch League. You know, I'm really, I'm really confident that the community will be very excited when uh, we kind of release the, the, the things that we're working on. Regarding Overwatch League specifically, you know, we saw a great community response and lots of early success. That took a lot of focus, but overall we think it's the right decision. It's been the right decision for the game and for the franchise. We're about to kick off the second season, and that's going to start on February 14th. That'll, that'll introduce eight new city teams. It will introduce home and away matches for some teams for the very first time. Um, and the first uh, match that's actually going to kick off is going to be a repeat of the Grand Finals between London and Philadelphia. So overwatchleague.com is where you can see that. Overwatchleague.com. Yeah. Oh, we have the next question, please. We'll take our next question from Brandon Ross with BTIG. Hi, thanks for taking the question. I was just hoping you could provide a little more color on your rationale for parting ways with Bungie and the Destiny franchise and, and kind of what happened with that game. Thanks. Sure. Thanks, uh, Brandon. This is Cotty. Uh, I guess let me say first that uh, we're confident that this was the right decision for both parties. Uh, Bungie gets to focus on the IP that they created and we get to focus on our biggest opportunities on our biggest franchises uh, with our best resources. Um, you know, our decision was reached via mutual agreement with Bungie to sell back the commercial rights. And for us, at least, it was rooted really in our strategy overall. Um, first, as you know, we didn't own the underlying Destiny IP. 
um, and we do for all our other major franchises, which we think is not just a differentiator for us in the industry, but also controlling the underlying IP gives us the chance to move in with new experiences and new engagement models, which also come with you know, new revenue streams, and of course, structurally higher economics when you own the IP. And that leads to probably the second factor in our decision process, which is, you know, Destiny, it is highly critically acclaimed, uh, high quality content, but it was not meeting our financial expectations. Um, you know, as we went through at the end of the year, our, our financial planning for 2019, it indicated that uh, Destiny would not have been a material contributor in operating income to our business. Uh, and third, we had internal resources supplementing Bungie's work. Um, and you know that means they're tying up one of our scarcest resources, uh, which is developer talent, uh, which now under you know the arrangement we've reached will be freed up after a short transition period. You know, so late last year when we were exploring all our options on Destiny, you know, in November after our earnings release, we learned that Bungie was willing to acquire our rights, and we engaged in discussions with them, um, and ultimately wound up consummating the deal in late December. And it was a mutual, amicable agreement. And uh, you know, I just emphasize, I really do think for both parties, this is the right path forward, and it allows us to go implement the plan that we uh, talked about today. Thank you. Operator, can we have the next question, please? We'll take our next question from Matthew Thornton with SunTrust. Hey, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thanks for taking the question. Uh, maybe you could just update us on just timing around some of the mobile initiatives at, uh, at both Blizzard and Activision. Uh, including China as well as the rest of the world. Any, any updated color there would be, would be helpful. Thanks, everyone. Sure. Thanks, Matt, uh, for the question. This is uh, Kadi again. You know, as you heard in our prepared remarks, uh, mobile is a top priority for us, and we think it's one of our largest opportunities, uh, particularly with our global IP, which we think is really well positioned to bring to the mobile platform. Um, we see this every day with King, where you have a franchise at scale uh, globally. But we also see it with other great franchise IP like Hearthstone, where bringing that game to mobile brought in tens of millions of new players that are engaging in an ongoing and deep way with us. Um, you know, the thing to note uh, is mobile game teams, while smaller than PC or console, they still require time to prototype and to test. And particularly for us and our franchises, where we have high community expectations, when we bring them to market, we want to do it right. That said, Part of the announcements today and the work that we're doing and that we highlighted is to make sure that we're adding the right resources and enough resources to accelerate our mobile pipeline. Given the size of the overall opportunity, it's not just internal. We are working with external partners. We have multiple projects underway across the portfolio um, in various stages of development. And as you know, we've announced to Call of Duty Mobile and also Diablo Immortal. And you know, you, you asked sort of about both in status. They're both hard at work. We have no additional announcements to make at this time. But in both cases, we're looking to make sure that the IP is really well represented. For Diablo, it's an authentic and immersive, deep experience that we think getting it there has large global potential, and so it matters to get it right. And we'll share more about our titles and release dates um, as that comes to fruition. Operator, we have time for one last question, please. One last and we'll question, take our okay. last question from Kunal Maldi. Thank you. You mentioned that King advertising net bookings through more than 50% sequentially. It would be great if you could provide us with some more color in your expectations in 2019. Well, uh, Bobby, I, I would uh, say... Oh, go ahead, Bobby. Go, go ahead, Umar. Oh, I was just going to say, Bobby, that um, I'm going to step back and just uh, think about the business kind of in a few phases. You know, first, uh, we, you know, decided that we really needed an ad product uh, that worked and is differentiated. So we went and invested in uh, the right teams to, to drive that. And uh, I think it's paid off. We have uh, a pretty good and differentiated native uh, uh, ad product uh, that is working quite well with uh, player satisfaction on the inside and increasing our monetization. And in 2017 and what you saw in 2018 was we uh, scaled the business by lighting up more of our inventory and adding uh, more impressions in our network. And that was uh, a key driver as we started scaling the business. And uh, we hit some important uh, you know, financial milestones in the year in 2018, uh, first profitability in Q1, and then growth in every quarter after that. 
And um, I think the ad business is going to start to be meaningfully uh, contributing to the King overall. Um, so we expect it to cross the 100 million uh, booking threshold uh, this year. And as I look ahead, I think on the next phase uh, about uh, where the ad business is heading, it's about continued scaling. Uh, so we will continue to uh, scale more in the inside the ad network at King. <coughs> And we have more work to do there to uh, enable it in more of our games. And we're continuing to educate our demand partners on kind of the power of our ad product. And there's uh, really good momentum there. And I think kind of after that, we will think about even more ways to deploy the ad product. It could be in new mobile experiences or esports. I think the team has uh, a ton of learnings and potential that, uh, that could be applied in there. Yeah, and I would just add, I, th I think it's an excellent team. The ad product is excellent. They've started to make real inroads in getting people to better understand what the opportunities for advertisers uh, is. And uh, I think that uh, I'll just echo whom I'm sentiment that there's a lot of momentum uh, in that business. And that, um, I think, concludes our call today. I just wanted to, on behalf of our, our team here, uh, thank you all for your time and uh, and engagement today, and we'll look forward to seeing many of you uh, on the road uh, or up to our next uh, our next earnings call. So, thanks very much. And this concludes today's call. Thank you for your participation. You may now disconnect. All right. So, um, so yeah, uh, that's it. That is the. Activision Blizzard fourth quarter calendar 2018 results conference call. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I was kind of surprised by a few things. I, I wish I could have. I, I didn't want to interrupt too much uh, while they were talking, obviously, uh, so you guys could hear it. Um, might put this on YouTube. I might make another video kind of kind of giving a little bit more like in-depth thoughts about it. <clears throat> but yeah, I, I think overall... Uh, I, I I mentioned this before. I mentioned this at the beginning of the stream before the the actual uh, conference call started. I don't know how much stock Blizzard is really putting into Classic as far as uh, seeing how big of a financial success it could be. It's not a full release, or it's not like a it's not like a they're not launching a product where you go and you buy it and you you pay the initial fee and then it's got its own separate sub fee. The, it's it's a sub linked in with the current wow fee wow sub fee so if you sub to wow you get retail wow and you get classic wow and i think that is i think that's a good idea honestly i do think that's a good idea for uh for blizzard because i think that's going to get the most people playing classic right it, it, make it the most accessible and i think accessibility right now in gaming you've seen it with fortnite you're seeing it with apex legends now apex legends has over six hundred thousand views uh, I believe right now on Twitch and Call of Duty sitting at around 30,000, you know um, Accessibility I think is a really important thing and and I think uh, I think that's good right now If you have that many people who are not currently sub to WoW and they decide to sub to WoW Because they can play classic now, which is a significant number of people I, I my thing is I think they're severely underestimating the player base of people who are not currently playing or paying for World of Warcraft that are going to pay to have a sub fee to play Classic. I, I, I think they're... I think not only are they underestimating that now, I think that if they get the formula for Classic right, if they do it correctly, then you have a cash cow. You, you, you have just... You can just like let it roll and you just like launch fresh servers because if you don't launch fresh servers, people are going to go back to private servers. They're just going to be able to just sit on it, basically. Now, sure, they might notice something like, okay, we got to make a tweak here and there. The same thing happens on private servers. The same thing happens every fresh. We're like, okay, we did this thing wrong. Let's fix that. We did this thing wrong. Let's fix that. Uh, I, I think if if it's done right, I think Classic is just like a, a constant stream of, of uh, revenue for Blizzard. And what I'm worried about is I, I don't think that they... Um, I, I don't think that they're putting enough stock in WoW as they should. So, um, anyway, I'm going to stop the recording. We'll put this on YouTube and then I might make a separate video kind of talking a little bit more about my, uh, more about my thoughts and stuff. So, um, if you haven't subbed to my YouTube channel yet, I'd appreciate it if you sub. 
follow me on Twitch, twitch.tv slash SFANTV. Um, it's up here, of course, you too. Twitter, SFANTV, Instagram, face, or SFANTV. Everything is SFANTV. Facebook, everything. So do that, and uh, I'll see you guys soon.